Okay, folks, now it's time to look at the comic book Cargo by Andrew M. Rodriguez. Uh, this is a second pass review, and by that I mean I've actually had a chance to look at this comic before. Uh, Andrew M. Rodriguez, the creator who did really every aspect of the creative portion of this book, story, art, colors, and letters, uh, he asked me to review it and uh, see if I could find any problems with it before it went to print. And so he's actually got me listed in the editorial credits, for which I thank him immensely. This is the first time I've been in any comic book credits in probably 25 years. So uh, so I am very grateful to be once again on the scene. And um, I have to apologize in advance, though, because when I did do this second pass review, I found a few things that I should have caught and mentioned the first time around. So there will actually be, be uh, a few items, and not just because there are new pages uh, added for cargo, although that is a thing, uh, there were a couple of uh, uh, prologue pages that were added that, at somebody's suggestion that I never got to see before the book went live. So uh, so I will be making mention of those. And uh, towards the end of the book, there are a few things that I picked up on that I didn't realize were there the first time around. So let's uh, let's start getting into it, starting with the cover, which I think is a marvelous cover. You've got the main characters front and center, and you've got a very expressive title, and you've also got a couple of supporting elements that are pertinent to the, the uh, action that goes on in the book. So one of the things I did notice, though, about the logo is that it seems like these three outlying bits of text, kind of like subtitles or kind of like a log line for, for the book, uh, to use the Ripperverse term, um, these look like dialogue balloons. And honestly, when I saw these dialogue balloons, I thought, who's saying that? Because I couldn't necessarily see any kind of pointer, except for this one bird that almost looks like a dialogue pointer pointing at the cat. So I swear, the first time I saw the cover and this logo all put together like this, I thought the cat was talking. <laughs> So I, I would at the very least have removed this bird so that that wasn't the case. Um, the other thing was, and, and really the, the nobody's talking and saying this uh, except for the omniscient third-person narrator here. Um, another thing I noticed is that uh, from a technical standpoint, you would have ellipses practically all over the place. You would have uh, ellipses here, there, and everywhere. But I do notice that all it does is just seem to clutter up things. And I, you know, when you're looking at a cover, you don't want to put just clutter on the cover. And on the cover, sometimes you can bend the rules. So I think I would have left the ellipses off of, uh, of these items as well. And I would have even left off the ending punctuation. And that would have just served to emphasize even more that th this is cover text and it doesn't necessarily follow all the rules. So uh, so that's what I would have to say about the cover. The other thing is I noticed that these two L's are lowercase, whereas if you look at the L in miles in the previous uh, balloon, it's, uh, it's uppercase. So there is that kind of inconsistency there. You probably want to keep it consistent unless you're using a sort of personal convention in which any any contraction that has the ll after the apostrophe is just going to have lowercase l's it's possible to kind of make up your own stuff as you go but it does have a tendency to look inconsistent if you do it too if you do the kind of switching up of text styles too much especially on the same page now, here is the first, this is the upper half of the first page of two new pages that were introduced into the book after my involvement with the book. And so this kind of starts the story in media res, and it gives the character um, some action scenes, like, really, really early on, because otherwise the book is slow to build to action, and I think somebody must have told Andrew at some point, 
you know, the fact that you've got a slow build throughout the book, you really should um, bring the reader in on a higher energy note. And that's not bad advice. The only complaint that I have, and it's, it's part of the reason why I've only shown as much of these two pages as I am showing, is that there's a lot of spoilers in these two pages that I see. There, there's things that I would not want the reader to know necessarily so as to preserve the mystery of the book. <coughs> so um, it's not a bad idea that these high energy pages were introduced, but it also does kind of rev the reader up quite a bit at the beginning and make it a little bit hard to settle into the much, much lower energy beginning of the book that is coming. So I, I have a very, very mixed feeling about this, this added scene. It's not something I probably would, it's not something I did suggest, and it's not something I necessarily would have approved if, uh, if I knew about the suggestion. Uh, this three-dot ellipse, I probably would have made a four-dot ellipse, since it doesn't actually lead into the, the next sentence. And here, here is an example where you have the double L, and it's not lowercase. It's actually uppercase. So you have between the cover and here, you have that inconsistency. So just, just be aware that these inconsistencies can and do exist, and be careful not to make a habit of them. The next thing that comes along is a quote from the Bible, the New Testament, I will be with you always, even until the end of the world, Matthew 28, 20. Just uh, from a marketing standpoint, if somebody's flipping through your book and sees a Bible verse in there, they're going to think it's a Christian book, or a Christian-themed book, at least. And if that is the case, fine. If that's not the case, then you probably don't want to have that in there, because even in the case of a Christian-themed book, if somebody is, you know, and if somebody feels antipathy towards Christianity, they're probably going to want to put it back on the rack at this point. You know, there are some people who just really can't stomach religion, and so if you're going to wind up with religious overtones, you better kind of sneak that up on the reader as opposed to just being blatant about it. Now we come to the actual uh, and you know, low-energy beginning of the book, which I found to be quite all right. Uh, it, it doesn't it, Beginnings of these stories do not need to be high energy. And in this case, we're getting uh, introduced first to the setting, uh, the, this, this, this valley that of, of desert that is being driven through. We're being introduced to the truck, which is going to be uh, a main character in the book itself, really. And here you have this butterfly flitting along, and the words, rud, 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 showing that the truck is approaching. And then you have a rud, rud, rud here, which would seem to say that the truck has gone away, and yet all of a sudden, rud, 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 and the, and the truck is right there plowing into the butterfly and uh, squishing it up against the, uh, the windshield wipers. And I'm like, that just, I don't see how that makes sense, that you would have the noise going away and then all of a sudden appearing out of nowhere. To me, what probably should have happened is the rud, rud, rud should have been made to be of increasing intensity as it went from panel one here to panel two. And then that would show that the butterfly was pretty much doomed. So now we have our main character, Max, and he's talking to Zack, his supporting character. And Zack is basically the dispatcher, uh, and Max is the trucker. He's discussing their next load that they're going to be shipping, and uh, Zach tells him, this next job is a high-end client, trust me. And Max says, well, what do you know about him? And I notice that there is an apostrophe missing uh, before the EM. And the other thing that I noticed was he's drinking a bottle of, uh, of tequila called Alma Perdida. <coughs> Now, Alma Perdida is Spanish for lost soul. And I feel like this is 
a bit too much forecasting into Max's character. Because what it seems to be telling the audience right away is that Max is a lost soul. And that's something that you would rather have the audience come to understand for themselves. In fact, this is something that I mentioned in quite detail. I went into in, in detail in my video on Gooding the Polymath called Here's What You Don't Tell the Reader uh, or something like that. Um, they're, they're, you don't want to tell your readers how to view your characters. You just want to let your characters be who they are and then l let the reader figure out for himself or herself what this character is. And so it, it's not going to take that long in this book to figure out that, you know, Max ha is kind of feeling disconnected from the world, is kind of feeling... Um, well, I mean, just to put it simply, like a lost soul, that the reader doesn't really need to be clubbed over the head with that extra information here. So Zack informs him that he needs to turn left, so he screeches and turns left, and he, and he actually comes to a halt in front of this house, but it wasn't really clear to me that that's what was going on, that he was actually stopping in front of this house for two reasons. One is the skirt that's at the end is very, very small, and it was hard to see and hard to detect that that actually meant that there was so much braking going on that the, the truck came to a complete stop. It just looked like he turned down the street, and now he's looking out the left side of the car, or the truck, as he's going by. And another reason is, if you look at the roof of the house, from one panel to the next, they don't look like they're at the same angle of incline. It looks, <laughs> you've got a, a uh, uh, acute angle here. It looks more like an obtuse angle here. That would tell me these are two different houses when in fact they are supposed to be the same house. So that that's an, uh, uh, an art problem there that kind of had me wondering Okay, really? Are, are we still are we still in motion at this point? Because I think they're still moving, but really, it's not until you hit this uh, engine noise going from rud 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 down to roo and then diminishes out that you realize, okay, yeah, the truck has stopped, and then of course now he's getting out of the car. So he gets out of the car, and he's got the house on one side, and he's got the road behind him, and he's got the truck to the other side of him. So what way is he facing exactly that we're able to see nothing at all in the distance behind him? He just seems very, very disconnected from his actual setting at this point. I would have expected maybe a sliver of truck or a sliver of house or maybe, you know, a little bit of road behind him. Something to show where he is in relation to really anything. But he just seems to be standing in space. Now this you know, does fix up in the next panel or so when he realizes that the ringing that he's hearing is not coming from his own phone. It's coming from a pay phone that's uh, in the distance. So he goes to the pay phone and he picks and, and he says, uh, so who's this shipper that's too busy to meet me face to face and what's my cargo anyway? And then the shipper says, that is none of your concern. All you need to know. And here we have another like textual inconsistency where you have italics in one case, and then you have straight up and down text but underlined in the next case, it's like you got to pick a style of emphasis and go with it. Uh, unless you're trying to signify something about the speaker's accent, but that's really impossible to distinguish at this point. Also, this part where it says, arrive in, where he's uh, being commanded, arrive in three days' time, uh, the plural days is what should have the possessive effect, so you would have D-A-Y-S apostrophe as opposed to uh, D-A-Y apostrophe S. Now, it turns out he has to get the, uh, use a forklift in order to get his cargo onto the truck, and the forklift is out of power, so he brings jumper cables over and connects them, and he also sprays the engine block with something? Is is that what he's doing? Or, I mean, he's, he's doing some sort of spraying maneuver, 
But I have no idea what that would be. I mean, to me, it's like, aren't you just supposed to connect the stuff up and then turn the turn the car on and see if it works? I don't know what the spray is for. I don't know if you know how many other readers are going to know what the spray is for. So this is just a, a scene where it's kind of like, okay, he's doing he's doing auto mechanic stuff, but I'd be hard pressed to tell you what it is. And now we've got, uh, I'll be glad to leave the valley for a bit. Too many crappy memories. And here we have, right right in front of us, the, the way that L's are treated. And like we saw earlier, it's not always consistent that uh, after the apostrophe, you always have the lowercase L's. So here's an example where you've got the two different kinds of double L appearing in the same dialogue. Uh, moreover, the letter I isn't uh, treated the same way either, but this one's probably a little bit more consistent. I have I didn't go through the entire book to check, uh, but it says I ain't flying blind with a with a strong capital I, and then just a line up and down, not with a dot or anything, which is kind of more of a medium or a soft capital I, I guess you could call it. Um, but just be aware that you're doing that. Then after he gets back outside, he's attacked by a snake. He he leans backwards, and he's going to the left as he's leaning backwards. And then a bullet arcs down, and then you see a splat, and then he's falling in the opposite direction. And then finally the phone uh, over in the phone booth says, time is of the essence. And I, I just felt like this was a very, very chaotic scene, especially with what looks and feels like a violation of the 180 degree rule here. Even though there's not two different characters involved, but in a way there are, because you know the snake is, is lunging at him from right to left. He's falling back away from the snake, falling right to left. But then, when the bullet comes down, he starts falling left to right. And does that mean that he got hit by the bullet? Um, I mean, it would seem like there should be like blood flying out of his head if he, if he got hit from the, the bullet from behind. Or else, maybe he was shot in the back and it spun him around. And then for the, the phone to say, time is of the essence, well, does that mean he got shot or not? I'm not actually going to tell you what happened in this scene, um, because I don't want to spoil anything, but it, it, it made for kind of a, a chaotic mess with that panel the way that it is, such that when you get to the last panel and it's revealed what happened, you're kind of like, well, I wouldn't have, you know, felt that was what had happened given the sequence of panels that I just saw. Now, at this point, we have left issue one of the book, and we are now in issue two, and we're introduced to the other protagonist of the book, whose name is Delilah, and she is looking for her father, and uh, she is kind of talking to herself and, um, and also writing in a journal to get her feelings out, and as she's talking, Another thing that I noticed was the lack of ellipses, and I'm not going to harp on this anymore. I think basically a convention has been settled upon that when you have these ellipses going on, you're just going to have the dot 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 at the end of the preceding portion, and you're not going to have the dot 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 leading into the second portion, um, which is fine. I think that actually works pretty well here. Uh, it doesn't. It, it it doesn't. It doesn't bog down the text. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it if it works for every comic, but here it does seem to work. So it's not something that I'm going to uh, complain about any further from this point. See, this is what it would look like if you actually put the uh, the dot dot dots in. Does that really serve, or do you want the reader to just go ahead and move into the next text, you know, very quickly? It it probably feels better if the reader does it quickly. Now her she winds up having bike problems, and then she sees two trucks coming because you got truck number one over here and truck number two over here, right? No, it's actually one truck at two different instances in time. 
this is the, the the same truck but as it's further away and this is the same truck close up now that's not immediately apparent largely because of how the background looks you've got the background segueing into itself very nicely you've got a single background really for both trucks and that includes the rocks on the uh, left hand side of the truck so how is the reader supposed to know that this is one, this is one and not two trucks it's not clear at all and i really would have had some border separation probably not done any kind of panel layering in this case just go ahead and have one panel two panel showing, showing the truck and then three panel showing that it is actually max's truck max is the the driver who we were dealing with in episode one and max happens to say the road pirates around these parts ain't above the damsel in distress routine so he actually passes delilah by uh, one thing I would have done is put quotes around damsel in distress, just to signify that that's the name of the routine that he's talking about. And then she notices that there is a car following Max, and this whole scene feels kind of cramped. I mean, I do appreciate the humor of the fact that his headlights are almost touching her headlights, but really this is such a claustrophobic scene on account of all this it makes it seem like the car is a lot closer than it appears you've got the the car jutting into both panels as if it's right about to hit her when it's really not if you look at the next page you know it's got plenty of room to to navigate around her um so it looks way too compressed in the previous set of panels and in this particular uh panel one of the things that we don't get is this is a sense of time because this is actually one car that is moving around her it, instead it looks like three cars of the same type and there's no no way to really know that it's not three cars and the way that you would normally handle that in a comic is that you would have each of these two cars behind be faded kind of you know they they would look faded and indistinct compared to the more sharper and darker um, uh, present moment uh, object. So, you know, it's, it's almost like if you've ever seen a, if you've ever seen a picture of Spider-Man like fighting various characters and bouncing all over the room, the aspects in which he is doing the bouncing usually look paler and less distinct than the ones in which he's you know in the present moment still fighting so that's that's the kind of that's the kind of motif you really need for this either that or you need to have something that you know is going to border these panels in such a way that or, or it's going to break this panel up into three panels to show what goes on from moment to moment so having been abandoned by both truck and car uh she now has to walk in the cold and uh and she's singing to herself you are my sunshine my only sunshine and the only problem that i have with this is in the dialogue continuity the fact that she is singing the exact same thing when it's later and it appears to be i don't know hours later maybe it makes it feel like no time at all has passed if she's singing the exact same song I mean, you, you at least need to have her singing other lyrics in the same song just to show that there's been some sort of progression. But this is almost like, you know, no time has passed at all. If it weren't for the coloring and the actual mention of later, you would think, and you still do think kind of just on entering the scene, that nothing's changed and, and no time has, has occurred between where you left off and where you're picking up now. So have a change of dialogue uh, in the song, as well as a uh, change of color, change in, in the caption box saying later. Uh, we get a, uh, a, a brief segue back to Max as he's driving, and he's kind of lost in a reverie. And in this uh, particular uh, dialogue balloon, we have Zach saying, hey, you got your ears on? Focus. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And here it just looks like there's two dialogue pointers coming off of the balloon. Now, one of these is supposed to be kind of the electrical spike type pointer because it's coming from a radio. Uh, it's supposed to be like the two up top, but it doesn't look enough like that. So I would have either dropped this particular dialogue or this, this particular uh, dialogue balloon spike, or I would have made sure that it looked a lot more like the two that were at the top. Then uh, Delilah hears noises that cause her to panic, and so she goes, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And then we have this middle scene, which you would think it's not an important scene, given by the fact that it's act there are elements of the other two panels that cover up the elements that are in this panel. But this is, in fact, important. She runs her tire into a rock. That causes her to trip. So I would have had this whole... Uh, second panel be the one that leaps out, being the one that is in the foreground and have the other elements behind it. So she falls to the ground, and then we notice these three dogs are standing right over her. And there's nothing between, and notice that there's nothing between her and the dogs which makes it confusing when in practically the very next panel you've got the three dogs you've got the bike between her and the three dogs how did that happen because it doesn't even look like she's moved you know and you don't see the bike in this scene to to be a buffer between her and the three dogs it's like how did the bike get there it's it's just there's a placement problem here that takes place then they start chasing after her, and she runs away. She picks up the bike and is running away, and the dogs are running after her. And I'm like, how do they not catch her? This, this goes back to a, a video that I just did on the Horseman trailer, in which I was basically saying, look, this is not a superhuman guy. How is he doing superhuman things? And I'm asking myself the same question here. How is she doing the superhuman thing of having to drag a bike along with her and run away from dogs that are obviously faster than she is, and they don't catch her somehow before she gets to the mouth of the cave. It would make more sense, I think, if she had used the bike to scare them somehow, like maybe she had had it shine a bright light in their face and honk at them, you know, made a loud noise, so that they were kind of scared of the bike. And that way it would explain why they don't just, you know, tackle her and drag her to the ground right away. It's because they're afraid of the bike. So she makes it into the cave, and the dogs harass her a little bit, but then, uh, then the dogs are scared off by this other monster. And there are a couple of things that I don't like about this panel in particular, and one of them is, of course, the panel break, because you've got... It, 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 it's again like with the car in the previous page that I showed. You don't want them to. You don't want to create an illusion of false proximity. You know they're not that close together. You're look and, and and moreover, you're looking at them from two different angles. You don't want to see this kind of overlap here. Moreover, you've got this this border at the top that is showing the cave it seems to be showing the cave opening but you're showing the cave opening from two entirely different views and yet somehow they match up seamlessly how does that work i mean you're you're, you're looking at the girl from this this rabid wolf's perspective you're looking at the rabid wolf from the girl's perspective and yet the top of the cave meets like that I, I don't I don't see how that's even possible. And yet there it is. It's just this is one of those things where these really need to be two different panels. And then the last portion is that we have this um we have her narrating this part about as a kid I'd hear ghost stories about the valley, how it was cursed and that monsters lived there. It's like great, but we've never seen this this thought balloon type convention used. It's it's almost like, well, actually, the way that it has been used prior with regard to Delilah is that she used it while she was writing in her adventure log. 
So if she was writing in her adventure log now, then we would understand what's going on here. She's, she's writing this down, and we're getting to hear her thoughts as she's writing them down. But we don't have that. I mean, she's not writing anything down in, in, the, in, in the page that I just showed. So why is it that we're getting that kind of voice? And the only other point in the book at which uh, we see a character thinking thoughts as opposed to speaking is when Max is kind of reminiscing and, and thinking about how he hasn't been to the city of Delphi not since Sophia and I went to see the lighthouse together. And this, so, so in this, in Max's reminiscences, we see his thoughts, which have no surrounding uh, balloon item at all. And so you would think that if this is how the girl is thinking, it would look the same way, and it might need to be a different font, or it might need to be more of a ghostly surrounding, you know, maybe a, maybe a pink background or something like that. Or, or even just kind of more of a, you know, a, a fuzzy white dialogue balloon, so that, uh, so that we understood that she was thinking these thoughts as opposed to either writing in a book or or speaking, because obviously she's not speaking. So it's kind of important to get these these dialogue and caption motifs down, so that the reader knows what is being read at any given moment. So those were the things that I didn't like about the comic in the sense that, you know, these were the things that I felt were technical flaws. Now, what did I overall like about Cargo? Well, first thing I liked is that it has two very different protagonists whose paths will soon converge. And when you have different protagonists, very, very different characters converging and having to work together, you get a lot of interesting friction between them because they're not going to have the same goals, they're not going to have the same motivations, they're not going to have the same methods. And so that's why, you know, some of the best buddy movies have such different characters. If you remember Lethal Weapon, you had Mel Gibson as the uh, ex-military guy who has had a tortured past, then you had uh, Danny Glover, who was the, the aged you know, detective who was more mellow and, and didn't like to, to do things in the stressful way uh, or the confrontational way, it, it, uh, you, you get a better mix when you have different characters, when you have characters of different personality types, and you definitely have that here in Cargo. And each of these characters has a mysterious past that's linked to a particular destination that they're approaching. You'll, you'll remember that in uh, a couple of scenes ago, I was showing you Max reminiscing about a lighthouse. Well, it turns out that Delilah is reminiscing at, in part of the, uh, the book about the same lighthouse. So they have that as a connection between them. And so there's a way in which they're linked that they don't know about. And that makes it a, kind of a mystery as to you know, do their paths actually intersect in some way, shape, or form? Or are they just total strangers who are happen to be linked to the same place somehow? Uh, what is Max's past? In which we're seeing we're shown scenes there's a scene in which he's wounded and and uh, he's looking for his daughter, and then there's a scene in which uh, Delilah is reminiscing about her father. And so you get these, these characters that have a past with them, that they're carrying with them, and maybe there's some intersection between the two, and that, that enhances the mystery of the book. Another nice thing is that Max's supporting characters complement him. He's got two supporting characters, one of which we saw is Zack, and the other is a sniper who is following him and is helping him complete his, his uh, cargo run. And... One uh, one of the things I like about the book is that they, too, have personalities that differ sufficiently from his that you really feel like you, you, you've got the interaction of these different characters in play. So the fact that they have their distinct voices, their distinct methods, their distinct um, philosophies... Uh, and, and you've got a friendship, uh, one and an uneasy alliance on the other... These are all 
good relationships to continue engaging the reader's interest with. The art's cartoonish style offsets the usual bleakness of a dystopian world. You get the impression, really, that the world is not as it should be. You, you find out later that there are plagues, there are wildfires, and uh, you, get the, you get the impression that humanity is in trouble. And yet, the fun style of the book doesn't make it a downer like it usually is in so many such dystopian world books. It makes it more of it makes it more entertaining to stay in that world. And then last but not least, you've got the question, what's in the box? He's carrying this cargo with him, what's in it? And that incentivizes the reader to keep reading. But as I said, unfortunately, that answer is almost certainly spoiled by the two-page prologue that was inserted, according to the suggestion of someone who was not me, who thought that would be a good idea. So that that is the one thing I would say is, Keep the secrets of the book close to the vest. Don't go revealing information. And that also goes for some of the later material in the book where you see character designs, and you're starting to see character names and character designs of characters that haven't even entered the book yet. So why are you telling the reader about those? Don't spoil things for the reader before the reader has the chance to encounter those things for himself or herself. Overall score. What do I find Cargo at compared to the comics that I've graded previously? Well, here is the list of comics that I've graded before, and I am putting Cargo at a 7.0, right beneath uh, Ethan Van Skyver's Cyberfrog number 2. And I think the, the one thing that is kind of hindering the book that would have kept it from matching Cyberfrog to or Cyberfrog 2's score is that Max and Delilah's stories have yet to converge, and it it feels like it's taking a lot of time for those stories to converge. Um, and we don't want to see that take too long. Eventually, this has to form a united narrative, or else there's going to be kind of this divided trek that's going to lose the reader's interest after a while. So I wouldn't go any further than maybe three or four issues before uniting the characters and at least introducing them to the point where even if they don't start up their, their mutual journey right away, you at least get them acquainted so that you could kind of start uniting the narratives of the characters. Because you don't want to go too long without these characters meeting up because after all the the book's cover the very first cover of uh of cargo implies that you're going to have these two characters working together and why why do that later rather than sooner is is the question there i mean if there's necessary story elements that have to happen before that takes place that's great um but make sure that you're not just going to be telling two stories that only happen to converge uh, at a particular point. It, it, it's, uh, it's one of those things where you want to make sure that you're, you're keeping all of the elements that hold the reader's in, uh, interest in play, in the same narrative, in the same scenes, so that the reader doesn't have to go through the book with a divided mind. Unless, again, that's really the intent of the book. But I would say that that is because when you get to the end of, of episode number two, you get a cliffhanger for Delilah that really doesn't have anything to do with Max. Max doesn't have his own cliffhanger in that particular book. And so it just makes it feel like it, 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 it highlights the division of the two narratives so strongly that you really want to see the narratives unite after that. And hopefully that'll happen pretty soon. So uh, so 7.0 for uh, Cargo, number one, and number two. Good job to Andrew M. Rodriguez. I will be putting his uh, link tree link in the product description, so please do go and check out the links and uh, see if you want to pick up uh, Cargo from there. Uh, that is it for me. I am Mike Partika. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. and. Uh, 
I just want to let everyone know that the next thing I will be re -re uh, reviewing is the Ripazine number two. So uh, Ripazine number two with uh, the first appearance of Sertia, the other uh, lethal force authorized private detective in Flores Park, Texas, or one of them. Uh, I think there's what two or maybe maybe uh, another, and that's it. I, I don't really recall uh, from the first forgettable book. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, actually, I am kind of, uh, I am kind of waiting to see where Salvage PI goes from here. I would like to see that finish up. I don't want to see Eric July start a whole bunch of stories and not finish them because he's already got that going with Isom. Uh, let's get Isom done. Let's get Salvage done. Let's get Sertia done. I don't know if it's a complete story in, the, in issue number two or what, but I hope it is. And then you know let's 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 have some actual complete stories under his belt that he can uh, that he can humble brag about. So uh, Ripazine number two review coming up next. Please do subscribe if uh, if you're interested in seeing that. And uh, this is Mike Bartika. I will talk to you later.